Episode 1, Putin's Plan. The message was short and direct. I should not go back to Moscow because I was going to be arrested at Sheremetyevo Airport. That's what Bruce Missimore heard when he answered his phone during a business trip to London in 2004. Missimore was a finance executive who'd been hired three years earlier by Yukos, Russia's then second biggest oil company. Yukos had aspirations of being listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and it needed an experienced American chief financial officer to implement Western accounting standards and Western-style business practices. That's what Missimore thought he would be doing when he and his wife moved to Moscow. Instead, he found himself with a front row seat to the world's largest state-sponsored theft. If you want to understand the story behind the story of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you can draw a straight line back to the Yukos affair. I think Yukos was the start of him trying out, well, let's see what the West will do and what the West won't do. And here we are today in the inaction on behalf of the Western powers to let him do this. I'm Lauren Steffi. Welcome to the first episode of Putin's Oil Heist, an insider's account of the Yukos affair. The early 2000s were an optimistic time for Russia. The Soviet Union had been gone for a decade, and Russia seemed to want to embrace Western capitalism and governance standards. For many businesses, from America and elsewhere, Russia represented a huge untapped market. Foreign investment would boost the Russian economy and the living standards of the Russian people, and U.S. companies would expand and make lots of money. Or at least that's what everyone thought at the time. What actually happened? Well, that's what we'll be exploring over the next six episodes. It's hard to remember now, but when he first rose to power, Vladimir Putin was seen as a reformer someone who wanted to strengthen ties with the West. This was 1999. Putin had a year under his belt at the time that I got a call to uh, interview with Yukos. And so I reviewed that whole situation, and it looked like Putin was supporting reforms, and he was then. Things were going well in Russia, and part of my decision for going to Russia was certainly that I would have the opportunity to help Russia modernize itself, bring it into the 21st century at that time, and change Russian government and accounting standards and everything else that we actually did. And it was quite the opportunity to do that. And I didn't see any reason at that time why Putin and his government wouldn't be reformers and continue to be reformers. Of course, that ended in 2003. What happened in 2003 involved Mikhail Hartikovsky, the oligarch who controlled Yukos and who, by that time, was the richest man in Russia. He was also Bruce Missimore's direct daily boss, although in a unique corporate structure, Bruce actually reported directly to the Yukos board of directors. Hartikovsky had grown up in Moscow. He'd been a communist youth leader, and in the mid-1980s, he'd graduated from technical school. In college, he fell in with a group of friends who liked working with computers, and they started a business. Initially started out, they made their money by importing PCs and selling them in, in Russia. They were all kind of very technical oriented, and, and Mikhail has always been a gadgets guy. He's the latest gadgets he has to have. PCs were in short supply in Russia at the time, and the business took off. Mikhail Gorbachev asked the Russian Communist Youth Organization, of which Hortokovsky was a leader, to try to rejuvenate and bring Western business practices to a group of failing Russian companies. Hortokovsky and his friends took on the task and became familiar with a number of Russian companies that they later acquired. And there were PCs in Russia, so he imported them and resold them, and they, they made some capital. With the capital, they started a bank, Meneta Bank, and that became Group Menetep with a number of other holdings. Menetep would become one of Russia's largest banks. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Menetep and other banks engineered a scheme to help keep the Russian government afloat by buying previously state-owned assets on the cheap. Menetep gained control of Yukos, which at the time had substantial oil and gas assets 
for about $300 million, plus the assumption of about $3 billion in debt. But like many of the oligarchs that emerged from that time period, Hartikovsky's dealings raised suspicion among many Russians who wondered how so much wealth had quickly become concentrated in the hands of so few people. During the Russian banking crisis in the late 1990s, for example, Hartikovsky protected his own fortune at the expense of depositors and investors, even though he eventually made them whole. You can go back to 98, maybe even 99, and see in the Wall Street Journal, he was Russia's bad boy of businessmen. You know, he was doing some pretty nasty things, but he thought he had to do to change things in the company and for Russia. Here's how author Steve Cole described Hartikovsky. He was a man in a hurry with a record of questionable business dealings. He seemed ambitious politically, and he increasingly flew to London and Washington and Paris, where he delivered speeches, built networks, and maneuvered for gain. He now positioned himself as the leading practitioner of normalized democratic capitalism in Russia. By the year 2000, Hartikovsky insisted he wanted to make Yukos more transparent. He brought in foreign directors to help oversee the company and establish internationally recognized standards for how it would operate, which was unique among Russian companies at the time. It was about that time that Misamore, who was living in Houston, got a call from a former colleague who heard that Yukos was looking for an American chief financial officer. And they wanted a list on the New York Stock Exchange eventually. And they said that's why they want a U.S. CFO. They want somebody with a good reputation in the markets. They want somebody who knows what they're doing. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, that sounds like something I'd be interested in because it wasn't more of the same. It was something that would be very different where I could have a huge impact. We'll be right back after this. A dying West Texas town. A new hope for the future. And a price that Trace Malloy isn't sure he's willing to pay. Lauren Steffi's debut novel, The Big Empty, is now available from Stony Creek Publishing. The Epic Times says the story builds like an accelerating freight train. And the Southern Review of Books says it's uncompromising in spotlighting the strains that the drive toward material achievement puts on the individual in the face of nature's whims. The Big Empty is both funny and painful as it explores the price of the future and its impact on the past. Get it wherever books are sold or visit stonycreekpublishing.com. And check out our other riveting Texas tales. Stony Creek Publishing. We tell the stories of Texas. Welcome back to Putin's Oil Heist. Miss Amore knew about Hartikovsky's past reputation, but after meeting with the oligarch, he was convinced that Hartikovsky had changed. He was also convinced that the oligarch was sincere about the reforms he wanted for Yukos and perhaps Russian business overall. What had happened is Mikhail had reformed. He had seen the error of his ways, no longer wanted to be the bad boy. Bruce Missimore had spent most of his career in finance, though the Finley, Ohio native entered Bowling Green State University as a music major. He later switched to pre-law and then to finance, and then got an MBA. After a couple of years in banking, he took a job with Marathon Oil which at the time was headquartered in his hometown. He worked in corporate finance for a few years and then moved to London, where the company's international operations were based. He became Marathon's international treasurer, returned to Finlay for several years to run the corporate finance division, and in the early 1990s, moved to Houston. In 1983, Marathon had been acquired by USX Corporation, which was formerly U.S. Steel. Ten years later, it moved Miss Moore to its Pittsburgh headquarters. He found he didn't like the steel company culture, and he took a job with Pennzoil in Houston, where he eventually became vice president of finance and treasurer. Among other things, he was in charge of mergers and acquisitions and oversaw Pennzoil's purchase of Quaker State, which was later merged with Pennzoil's downstream business and spun off to shareholders. In 
He became the effective CFO for the remaining Pennzoil company, which had been renamed Penn's Energy. But it was a tough time in the business. Oil had dropped to 8 to $9 a barrel, which is, of course, people don't relate to that today, 8 to $9 a barrel. I had created a capital structure based on $15 a barrel. We were hurting, terrible. So we went out and looked for a merger partner, and then I ended up creating a merger with Devon Energy, and Devon and Penn's Energy merged. So I took a golden parachute later that year, and that was in 1999. I had entertained a lot of offers to be CFO during 2000 from a number of well-known oil companies. I wasn't enamored by any of them because I couldn't have had a, a huge impact. I could have done a great job managing, but I wanted some place where I could have an impact. And along comes Yukos. Miss Moore took the job, and in February 2001, he and his wife moved to Russia. The country was still shaking off decades of Soviet rule, but they embraced the challenge of moving to a place where they didn't speak the language or could even recognize the alphabet. At the office, Yukos assigned Miss Moore translators, and many employees spoke English. For a few years, it seemed that Yukos might actually become a model for how Russian companies could do business in the global marketplace. It became the first Russian company to publish quarterly financial statements that adhere to what's known in the U.S. as generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP. That's a huge undertaking. But then there was also governance. I wanted to make sure that Yukos was in the forefront of governance in Russia, too. I also formed an investor relations function. And in 2004, I was named the top CEO or CFO in Russia for investor relations because we really concentrated on being transparent. Yukos grew rapidly, and investors and other companies both inside and outside of Russia began to take notice. And in late 2001, Yukos became Russia's largest oil and gas company and the only large Russian company with no state ownership. We were the fastest growing oil company in the world by rate of production, both percentage and actual production. We were the best performing international equity, both in emerging markets as well as the oil and gas markets. As you indicated, there were seminars in Russia on how to yukosize yourself or the process of yukosization. And that was a combination of financials, governance, growth, smart growth, I should say. And, you know, just the way that we were doing things overall. And Russian companies are trying to model themselves off of us until October of 2003. That's when everything Bruce Missamore and his colleagues had worked for would come to a sudden an unexpected end. Be sure to tune in to our next episode, The Arrest. But he, he believed he could battle the Russian legal system and win, and that I've called him naive for that. I'm Lauren Steffi. Join us for episode two of Putin's Oil Heist. Putin's Oil Heist was written and hosted by me, Lauren Steffi, and produced by the good folks at One Stone Creative for Stony Creek Publishing. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. For more information and show notes, go to stonycreekpublishing.com slash podcasts.